During our rehearsals of A View from the Bridge on 42nd Street, I passed a life-size cutout of her in the lobby every day. The famous laughing shot from the seven-year itch in a white dress with her skirt blowing up over a subway grate, whereupon I would sit for six hours as Van Heflin Eddie Carbone struggled with a compulsion he could not nail or destroy. Uh, the best work that anybody ever writes is the work that is on the verge of embarrassing him. Always. It's inevitable. Mm. Where he puts himself on the line, sometimes quite secretly, sometimes symbolically. I remember when I read View from the Bridge in college, uh, the way that it deals directly with sexuality and desire, it seemed like a departure in a way, filled with moral dilemma, but it's also about um, sort of uh, insatiable desire and sort of implacable appetite. I guess we're all, every artist is, has a tendency to throw himself into the world to see if he floats. When she appeared, the future vanished. She seemed without expectations, and this was like freedom. So I thought it was total honesty. That's what knocked me out. She seemed utterly without guile completely honest about herself and about anything she looked at. Whereas the society I came from was very guarded, judgmental, they made judgments of people. She accepted that everybody was who they were and what they were. This appearance of being absolutely free was simply a disguise. She was, in a way, the most repressed person imaginable. Been kicked around as a child. She'd been abused as a child. She'd been deserted, abandoned. She was a very courageous human being. It's because I loved her. So I took that attitude toward her. So the best of her, she thought, was in my eye. Therefore, the hope she had was with me. What was your first notice that you got that you were going to get in trouble with the Un-American Activities Committee? Well, they never bothered me until I married Marilyn. And then they, they were already on a downslope. People were getting bored with them. So they saw a terrific chance for a lot of good publicity. I would like to say that I'm fully confident that in the end my husband will win this case. We're a country of entertainers. You gotta be entertaining. Even the fascists have to be entertaining. That's only about giving the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, the help of God. They were replaying the crucible. Are you a member of the Communist Party? I'd said that I had attended meetings of communist writers, and then they said, well, was so-and-so in the room, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so in the room. And I had to say, I'm not gonna talk about anybody else. I don't believe, and I never did, that a man has to become an informer in order to practice his profession freely in the United States. Now the important question, Mr. Miller, where's Marilyn? She's waiting for me at home. When I got to Washington, the head of the committee offered to call off the uh, whole hearing if Marilyn would take a photograph with him. Oh, my God. And I said, uh, they better have the hearing. A few months later, we had to go through a trial in federal court, and I was found guilty of contempt. So I was fined $500 and uh, sentenced to a year in jail that was suspended. The whole thing was simply beyond description. Oh, 
Ruckus. It was dreadful. I mean, you couldn't go down to buy a newspaper. We couldn't just walk down and get an ice cream. You couldn't do that. I mean, the simplest things. If you're with somebody who's that celebrated in the world, it uh, distorts a lot of reality. And uh, so that was a difficulty to get over. Uh, and I never quite made it, I admit. You produced very little during your years with her. That's right. Why? I guess, to be frank about it, I was taking care of her. Uh, do I feel happy in life? Um, if I'm generally anything, I guess I'm generally miserable. <laughs> Basically, it was Tara that she was going to be found out as a faker. That she was going to suddenly was going to stand up and make some accusations against her. While she could be pleasant and fun and bubbly and, you know, lovely, she could go places that were just, uh, she was in pain. And you could see it come over her kind of in a way. And you were always trying to bu bu buck her up? Yeah, trying to get her to see the brighter side of things. <laughs> Which is uh, uh, just about the most thankless job you can possibly imagine. He's typically not doing things just to please somebody else. But I think he really did as much as he was capable of doing to try and get her to chase those demons away. Do you think Dad was under her spell, kind of? I think so. Or under his own spell of, you know, of being the, the hero, the savior, the, the one who could turn her. And The Misfits, I think, is a great example of that. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. This man never said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. I just thought it would be a terrific gift for her, because she'd never had a part in which she was supposed to be taken seriously, and she wanted to do that. I had written a story based originally on when I was living in Nevada, getting a divorce. I fell in with three cowboys while I was there, and they were hunting a Mustang. And they were warring on these beasts. Yeah. When they won, they felt good, and they felt confirmed in their manhood. In my film, Gable cuts him loose yeah. at the end. What are you doing? But that didn't often happen. <laughs> of course, what the Misfits was after was that this is an attempt by people to find some way of being home, at home in the world. And the world is so hard and so rejecting that they cannot find a niche in which to call home. The picture took an enormous amount of time because she was sick a lot of the time. What was wrong with her? She couldn't really gain for herself the confidence that she had to have to do this. She was extremely anxious that she wasn't really good enough for it although that's not the way she expressed it. She would blame people for not treating her right. At the last minute, she would find things to find imperfect about herself if she had to be someone. It was insecurity, of course, if you want to use a word. But, uh... Missing day's work. So everybody's hanging around all day long. And the, the esprit of everybody was non-existent finally. Several hundred people involved. 
who are leaning on this fragile creature. It's a terrific pressure. Come on, honey. We're gonna have some drinks. And the solution was all kinds of pills and alcohol, gigantic barbiturates. They finally had to stop shooting for about 10 days while she went back to Los Angeles and just recuperated. Look, there's no explaining a person like that. Terrible. Well. Because you have the gift for life, Rosalind. The rest of us, we're just looking for a place to hide and watch it all go by. Amen. Here's to your life, Rosalind. I hope it goes on forever. We finally got through the film, and it was a pretty good film. It wasn't what I'd hoped. We were separated during the shooting. And, uh, well, she went back to California and they started shooting another picture for Fox that she failed to complete. Yeah. And then you moved back here? Did you move here? Well, I, I started to live up here a lot. As I was coming to the end of the writing of After the Fall, the horrifying news came that Marilyn had died apparently of an overdose of sleeping pills. When a reporter called asking if I would be attending her funeral in California, stunned as I was, I answered without thinking, she won't be there. <laughs> 